Okay, I I tried sending him a message. Hopefully, he joins soon. I think it's ten thirty, and I have, we must start. Are we live already? Oh, great. Okay. So a very, very warm welcome, happy morning, afternoon, and evening to all our viewers all over the world. Welcome to our daily out and love and panel. And we have such wonderful panelists today, and I'm so happy to host the show. Thank you so much. So we are live. All right. So I'll start with uh, the introductions of all our wonderful panelists. I'm so excited. And I'll... I'll try to do it really fast because I want to keep this entire show for our panelists and I'm not going to be talking too much. So I'll do it really quick. And after the introductions, we have so many questions. I will ask questions to all of you, two questions each, and then we will leave it for Q&A and, and I'll note down all the questions from our viewers and then we, we could take it up for probably 20 minutes. So that's the idea. Um, so why don't um, I did share some pictures. Do you want to share them while I introduce our panelists? I think he can type it. <laughs> OK, um, so we'll start with Dr. Silesh Rao. And it's um, it's such a pleasure to meet you again, Dr. Silesh Rao, after meeting you last time in India. Um, Dr. Silesh Rao has over three decades of professional experience and is the founder and executive director of Climate Healers, a nonprofit organization dedicated towards healing the Earth's climate. He's a systems specialist with a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. Dr. Rao worked on the internet communications infrastructure for 20 years after his graduation. Dr. Rao is the author of two books, Carbon Dharma, The Occupation of Butterflies and Carbon Yoga, The Vegan Metamorphosis, and also an executive producer of four documentaries, The Human Experiment 2013, Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret 2014, What the Health of 2017, and A Prayer for Compassion 2019. A big applause and thank you so much for being here, Dr. Silesh Rao. And, and our next panelist, Dr. Pamela Ferguson, thank you so much for coming in. Dr. Pamela Ferguson is a vegan registered dietitian with a PhD in nutrition. She has 20 years of experience in community, clinic, and public health nutrition. She lives in Nelson, BC with her four plant-based kids. Pamela has an online private practice where, the, where she helps her clients from across Canada, and she helps them optimize their nutrition. So please visit www.pamelaferguson.com. And um, such a warm welcome to you. Thanks so much for joining in. Uh, Dr. Zishan Ali is not there, so we'll do his later. And our next panelist, Dr. Um, is, is Sandra, Sandra Kyle, our own New Zealand's animal activist, a vegetarian for nearly 50 years and a vegan for 10 years. Sandra lives in Wanganui, New Zealand, and has been a writer and activist for animal rights since 1990s. Her book, Glass Walls and website, and animalslaughter.org call for all slaughterhouses in New Zealand to close by 2025. Sandra produced the animal rights radio show Safe and Sound for four and a half years. That's so amazing. She's one of the two country liaisons for Safe Movement in New Zealand. And she also made a short film, 2025, was made about her solitary slaughterhouse vigils. And in 2018, Sandra received the Philip Wallen Animal Welfare Award, dubbed by the mainstream media as a singing vegan because she sings to slaughterhouse animals to comfort them. She was nominated in 2021 for a CC Award named after the patron saint for animals, St. Francis of Assisi. And our next uh, Thank you so much and a warm welcome, Sandra. And our next panelist is Dotsie Bosch. I'm a big fan of you. And um, I must tell you that my, my daughter really loves um, watching your pictures. 
So Doxy Bosch uh, is Switch for Good co-founder and also was featured in the famous Game Changers movie. After concluding a prolific professional cycling career that produced a medal at 2012 London Olympics Games, eight US national championships, two Pan American gold medals, and a world record. Dotsi Bosch has become a powerful influencer for plant-based eating for athletes and non-athletes alike. Named by Wesh News in 2012 as one of the top most influential vegans in the world, she utilizes her degree in plant-based nutrition to inform her impassioned messages as an advocate on behalf of humans, planet Earth, and animals. Never want to shy away from facing staggering odds fast like she did in the Olympics while riding for Team USA. And, and she also chronicled in the Netflix documentary Personal Gold. Her latest initiative is founding the nonprofit Switch for Good. Switch for Good launched in early 2018 with a television commercial featuring six Olympians from four different countries and proves that cow's milk is not a part of high performance diet. A warm welcome to you. Thanks so much for being here. And um, we have Genesis Butler as one of our panelists. Welcome, Genesis. Genesis is a 13-year-old vegan and animal rights and environmental and climate activist who has earned numerous awards for her activism, in addition to being featured on Marvel's Hero Project by Disney+. Plus. Whereas Genesis was named as real-life superhero for work she does to save animals. Genesis is currently leading the Youth Climate Safe movement, the first youth-led climate organization that focuses on animal agriculture and its impact on climate change and aims to give all the young voices a platform. So a huge applause from all of us. Thanks so much for all of you. And um, should we start with the questions or do we wait for Dr. Zeeshan Ali? I haven't received any message from him. I think, I think we'll go ahead. Let's start. Yeah. 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 Let's start. Yes. I agree too. So um, again, welcome once again for this wonderful dairy out love in panel. There have been a lot of um, webinars happening all over the world, including India. Even now at 8:30, there was one webinar where we are interviewing a lot of day moms about um, their story of becoming a vegan. So my first question is for Dotsi Bosch. According to Good, Fil Good Food Institute, the dollar sales have gone up for plant-based milks. But for animal-based milks, it is, you know, plant-based milks have done almost like 5% growth. And animal sales, animal-based milks have only done 0.1%. So a lot of people are switching from dairy products to plant-based products. That's a good sign. So <laughs> why do you think that is, Dotsi? Can you please explain from your experiences? Sure. Well, I think uh, because it's delicious and they feel better. <laughs> you know, we tend to definitely uh, think about... Uh, ourselves, <laughs> most most humans, and we want to be, um, you know, we want to be, we want to be better, and we want to feel better, and we want to have more energy, and we want to be able to do more. And you know, once the plant-based milk showed up in the dairy section in the dairy cases, and and people saw that there was an alternative, and they tried it, and they they found out it was delicious, and it made them feel better. I think it was just a no-brainer. So next steps are to get the plant-based cheeses in the, the dairy cheese section, right? Because that's, that's uh, I think once the cheese, once people realize how many amazing, incredible, delicious plant-based cheeses there are, I think that's the last domino to fall as far as the dairy industry goes. But, you know, it, many people report that they have uh, what feels like a dairy allergy, uh, about 13% of adults, and it really uh, highly affects children. And, 70% of the world's population has lactose intolerance. So just th those two stats alone show us that, uh, you know, when you switch over to plant-based milk and you're you're moving away from the the, the terrible deleterious effects of, of cow's milk on the body uh, from, you know, stomach bloating and diarrhea and itchy skin and asthma. I know for Olympic athletes, 
that's a big one is, is, uh, is the asthma and the, you can't say that dairy causes asthma, but you can definitely say that it exacerbates asthma. And uh, asthma is the most common chronic medical condition for Olympic athletes, which surprises so many people. But um, in the uh, Olympics in Atlanta, 20% of the athletes there uh, on Team USA reported having asthma. So I just think that we all feel so much better on any of the, I don't know, what do we have now? Almost 15 different types of plant-based milks. I know, I agree with you. Thank you so much, brilliant insights. Uh, we have Dr. Zeeshan Ali. Uh, thanks so much for joining in. Um, I think I'll do your introduction just before I ask you the question. So we move on to the next question. Welcome again, Dr. Zeeshan Ali. So- um, Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, most welcome. I, I completely agree with um, with Dotsi. My, my daughter has asthma and I, took her off from the dairy milk and now she's completely fine. So so I think that's the case with a lot of people, they suffer with dairy milk. And that also explains why even in Business Wire that mentioned, it mentions that the dairy alternatives market is valued at 35 billion by 2026. So this question is for Genesis. What do you think is the best plant-based milk available? And can you explain about um, how you got onto the vegan journey? And did you miss dairy? Yeah. Um, so the way that I went vegan was I figured out about um, how animals had to be used for our food products. And I didn't want to eat it anymore or buy it anymore because once I found it out, like, you can't really, like, think about it the same. So then first I went vegetarian with my mom. And then I found out about the dairy industry, which um, at the time she just had my little sister. So I started to think of it as um like this baby was just born and that's like if my mom got her baby taken away and then they took her milk and no one would want that so where are we doing it to cows so um that's when my whole family decided to go vegan and um my little brothers used to love drinking like chocolate milk and um used to love eating like cheese pizza and birthday cake and ice cream but um now there's all of those things that are just veganized and my favorite type of plant-based vegan milk um well, first we use like almond milk, but the one that I like, I love right now is oat milk. Oat milk is so good. You can do so much with it. Um, and it's good for you, it's good for the planet, it's good for your health. So I think it's a total win-win and you're not harming the animals. Oh, wow. That's an amazing answer. Thank you so much. And, um, and you know what, um, when we talk about the dairy milk, we all know that um, it produces almost 330 kilos of methane. And in California alone, which is a top dairy producing uh, state in the US, dairy cows amount to 45% of uh, the state's methane emissions and 35, 38% of nitrous oxide emissions. And, and, the, and the five greenhouse gases um, emitting out of the meat and the dairy industry is, is probably, Annually, actually, it's much, much bigger than all the ExxonMobil, Shell, and BP, all of them put together. So this question is for you, Dr. Silesh Rao. Uh, what do you think um, would be the ecological benefits of a dairy-free world? Uh, well, a dairy-free world will be a world that thrives, whereas a world with dairy is a world that's going to die. So it's as simple as that. You know, it's, uh, Dairy, to me, is the gateway drug animal agriculture and because once you accept that dairy is okay then you will accept that beef is okay and you know mutton is okay and all these animal uh, products become okay so uh, fundamentally animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change we wrote a paper about it in 2019 and it just got accepted for publication so it's going to be out there in in the literature and basically, we showed that it is responsible for 87% of all greenhouse gas emissions, at least 87%. So, and dairy is one of the um, main contributors to that. Even though the way the accounting is done, they they try to minimize the impact of dairy and put most of the impact on um, beef. But in reality, dairy and beef are exactly the same industry. So it's really one big industry that's causing this problem. And the reason why it is such a huge contributor to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions is because of the land use. 
So 37% of the land area of the planet is being used just to graze our animals. And on that land, we are only storing 2% of the land carbon. So if you think about it, you know, I mean, uh, uh, land has three times as much carbon as the atmosphere. And on the, in the atmosphere, we have put 30% more carbon than should be there. So which means we have to just increase the carbon on land by 10%. If we just return the grazing lands back to forests, we can clearly, we can do this, right? And that's why it's the main, leading cause of climate change. Wow. That's that's so well explained. 37% of land is used for grazing. Um, that actually reminds me, you know, when um, there's nothing available in India, actually. So I live in India and I see these young calves and, uh, you know, they're eating all the trash, they're eating the plastic on the roadside. And it's, it's so disheartening to see that they just wander by without their mom, without, without the cows around, their moms around. And then we we also have seen a lot of um, footages where the the moms are running behind the the newborn calves. So this question is for Sandra. Sandra, can you please share your experience bearing wit witness in the dairy industry? Thank you, uh, Dr. Vidya, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, share with you all some of my experiences and uh, some of the insights of my friends as well. I, I've lined up a few photographs uh, to show, and um, I hope I'm not going to talk too long. It may take about 10 minutes to get through them, but I'm hoping to give you a little bit of uh, background information about the dairy industry uh, and hopefully cover some things that are, are not so well known. So in, in my opinion, dairying is one of the most egregious ways that we can uh, treat our fellow, fellow animals. I was a vegetarian for nearly 40 years before um, found out about dairying and I went vegan overnight because I was so shocked at what I learned. Uh, there are about 260 million uh, dairy cows uh, throughout the world and uh, here in New Zealand there are about 4.8 million which is approximately one dairy cow per New Zealander. Um, I have a, a friend who does wonderful work for animals now uh, through, with her husband Gareth through the website um, Vegan for the Animals. And this is uh, Jackie, taken some years ago when she was a dairy farm worker. And she's with one of her favourite cows, uh, calves there, Suki. And um, Jackie told me that uh, about some of her jobs on the farm, and one of them was to order in the um, the people who came, the technicians who came to artificially inseminate the cows. And she said that that they'd put on a, a glove, and then their hand would disappear up. The, the, the cow right up to their shoulder as they, um, you know, penetrated the, uh, the cow deep inside. And with the other hand, they would uh, insert a metal straw uh, filled with bull semen into the vagina of the cow. And... Um, she said they would often start swearing at the cow and she didn't know why. And they explained that the cow had tightened, was deliberately tightening her muscles just to make him uncomfortable. Um, and I, I must admit, for me, this was a bit of an epiphany because it, it, I think it tells us about the being inside so helpless so um, unable to express autonomy in their lives but can tighten some muscles and uh, and and hurt the person who is hurting them 
So another job uh, that my friend Jackie had was uh, once the uh, ensuing pregnancy took place and after nine months uh, the cow was the calf was born, she would go when it was just hours old into the uh, paddock with her quad bike and a trailer behind it and another farm worker would scoop up the calf and put it in the trailer and then Jackie would have to drive off. And she said that the um, that the um, uh, the, the, the calf would call out for its mum and the mother would frantically try to run after the quad bike but of course to no avail, avail. so what we're seeing on the um on the screen now is one of the photos of a little bobby calf that i took last season i um do vigils at two houses here in Wanganui. one of them uh, kills bobby calves and uh two months of the year, August, September, we have up to two million bobby calves who are killed in New Zealand. They are mainly, they're not entirely wool calves because of course they're superfluous in the industry because they cannot give milk. So we saw the picture of those two darling little calves and if I can get close enough, I can scratch their heads or pat their, their, their noses. And if my fingers get close to their mouth, they begin to suckle my fingers. And, um, and I've heard that that's what they do in slaughterhouses as well, to their slaughterers. They try to suckle their fingers. So um, the, the bobby calf truck comes, uh, goes around to all the farms in the area and picks up the bobbies that have been left at the farm gate and brings them in for slaughter, uh, as well as picking up live bobby calves as young as four days old. Um, they pick up dead bobby calves. Dead bobby calves are called slinkies and they're um, the animals that have been uh, killed. Uh, that's a, a, a depot uh, where it's basically some kind of a shed or, or bin where the dead bodies of cows that were still born or sick or um, uh, otherwise non-viable and they've been shot in the head if, if they're alive they're uh, shot in the head by the farmer i think we have a, a photo of a little calf with uh, a bullet in its head and so these these uh, dead babies were um uh, photographed last season by one of my friends, Caitlin, in the Animal Save movement, and they're quite a common sight in rural New Zealand. So um, it's very hard to see these little babies standing in the truck, trembling on their legs, uh, confused, sometimes with their umbilical cords still attached. Um, and it's also very hard, that's another slinky we see there, it's also very hard in the slaughterhouse to see the dairy mums with their huge, great big uh, udders that um, uh, after sometimes only four or five years completely worn out from constantly giving milk uh, twice a day and having their babies taken away from them uh, within hours of birth. So, um, in um, uh, it, the, as well at it, the slaughterhouse, when I see the dairy mums, oh, that that particular photo I'll come to in a moment, but um, sometimes cows are pregnant when they arrive at the slaughterhouse in New Zealand. A friend of mine, uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, found out that about a um, uh, hundred cows uh, gave birth 
either in holding pens or on the slaughter truck uh, in slaughterhouses uh, last year. And although it's against the law to um, have a, a late stage pregnancy cows trucked, it does happen. And uh, so these calves um, will be killed at the slaughterhouse and there they will be used for um, um, uh, uh, skins, for their skins. Now, sometimes an early stage pregnancy is uh, detected at the slaughterhouse of a dairy mum. And sorry. Uh, Sandra, uh, I have another question uh, about this, so we can take it later. But thank you so much. It's, I mean, uh, we all felt like crying, and um, I hope the world goes dairy free, completely dairy free. And that said, and it happens very soon. A lot of people are actually planning to go dairy free. A lot of people are trying, but they're worried about their calcium. So this question is uh, for Dr. Pamela. <laughs> Can you please help us and all the viewers who probably have all these questions in their mind, what about my calcium? What do I do for my bones? Absolutely. And the great news is that we don't need to worry about our calcium at all on a dairy-free diet. Uh, there are abundant sources of calcium in the plant kingdom. So in when you eat uh, a plant-based diet, you'll actually be getting calcium from across many different sources. Some of the best sources will be from uh, leafy greens. So kale, for example, is a wonderful source, but also um, nuts and seeds are good sources, particularly sesame seeds. So if you enjoy tahini, tahini dressings are very good. Then also tofu, the way that we set tofu and press it, we use calcium in order to set the tofu. So uh, tofu is a wonderful source of calcium. And I would encourage you, if you are looking to transition to plant-based milks, look for the milks that are fortified with calcium. Uh, and many producers of non-dairy milks will fortify their product with the same level of calcium that you would get in a dairy product. So it's not difficult at all to meet your calcium requirements on a plant-based diet, eating varied uh, plants from across the different plant-based food groups, and also choosing fortified non-dairy milks. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And, and and I think, and they're very delicious. I, I don't know how people like um, dairy milks. I never like them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I absolutely love non-dairy milks. We have a variety of them here. As we mentioned in the introduction, I have four children and they have different preferences of milk. So often we're buying like three or four different types of non-dairy milks. We love them all. They are very delicious. So just go out and explore and try the one that you're going to like. If you've tried soy milk in the past and you're not sure about it, try oat milk, like Genesis mentioned, for example. So good for the planet, so good for our health, better for the animals. Absolutely a win all around. Yes, I completely agree with you. Thank you so much. I loved your answers and, and I completely agree with you. Sesame seeds, are, are the powerhouse of calcium. We don't have to worry about calcium at all. And um, we just missed Dr. Zishan Ali. So I'm going to do a quick introduction of Dr. Zishan Ali. Dr. Zishan Ali is a Kickstart India program specialist at Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, DC. He uses his working knowledge of chronic diseases, nutrition, and the Indian culture to develop content for the 21 day Kickstart India program. He also writes scientific reviews and articles on non-animal based research methods. He supports the outreach efforts of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine by reaching out to new members, healthcare professionals, physicians and researchers at the medical and scientific conferences. He received his doctorate degree from Johann Wolfgang Gott University, Germany, and he held a Marie Curie fe uh, fellowship from 
Gabriella di Annunzio University, I hope I said it right, in Italy in 2010, and postdoctoral fellowship at University Piemont Orientale, Italy, 2012. So warm welcome to you, uh, Dr. Zishan Ali, and I go straight to your question. We were talking so much about dairy and the dairy consumption um, because of time constraints, I'm not going to be uh, talking a lot about those statistics that I wanted to, but but it is very clear, it's very imperative from so many studies that that dairy does cause a lot of lifestyle disorders. It is, I mean, it's a major risk factor for a lot of people. And, um, and also uh, PCRM also suggests, uh, um, states some statistics like, almost like 75% to 95% from these two ethnicities, like the African-American and Asian ethnicities have lactose intolerance. Can you please um, explain why dairy milk is so unhealthy and so harmful and what should we do and how should we avoid it? Uh, th thank you, Vidya. And I'm really sorry for the delay. There was some glitch in the internet. And uh, it's really wonderful to be here and wonderful to be among the elites uh, panelists. So the question is about dairy and why it is so harmful to the human health. Uh, yes, you have mentioned some stats and I would like to mention a few more that there are several research studies that have been done where they have found that, for example, women who consume three or more glasses of milk per day have 60% increased risk of developing a hip fracture and a 93% increased risk of death. So previously we thought that milk because of its calcium would help uh, for the bones and for it will not, uh, it will for the healthy bones, but we are learning more and more that actually it is causing osteoporosis. And uh, we, are, we have also, from uh, there are studies where they have found a direct correlation of milk intake with oxidative stress and inflammation. For example, there are biomarkers of uh, a stress like prostaglandin F2 alpha and uh, interleukin 6 for inflammation. So they found that there is a direct intake. So that means you drink more milk and you get those more biomarkers uh, in your uh, serum on your blood. Another mechanism of action for milk to be harmful is because of the D-galactose levels because that can also uh, cause inflammation and stress. And there's a lot of research which has been done where they have linked uh, D-galactose as a molecule of uh, causing um, uh, stress and inflammation. And remember that milk is lactose and it's broken down into glucose and galactose. So that's why the galactose level is very high. And then uh, everybody knows that 50% of the calories in milk comes from fats. That means half of the calories coming from fat. And this definitely acts as fuel of, for most of the chronic conditions. Because I remember Dr. Neil Bernard's uh, theory, or Neil Bernard's, uh, 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 ex the way he explains type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, it's a buildup of fats inside the muscle and the liver cell. So when you are eating a diet which is very high in fats, and milk is 50% calories coming from fats, and what you can expect is all kind of these lifestyle disorders. Another problem with milk is uh, it is very high in insulin and insulin-like growth factor, and which are both related to causing prostate cancer. And as you all know, that pros prostate cancer is the second most common cancer among men in the United States. So we, we have to be really looking at all these numbers and signs and research studies when we are talking about milk and especially uh, these days I'm in India and uh, and here in India, uh, dairy is, in, is is the culture. There are so many religious sects in, 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 uh, in India where the only source of protein and calcium is dairy. They drink three glasses of milk. And the reason why we are seeing so many uh, cases of osteoporosis and uh, even osteoarthritis in India is also because of the very high dairy consumption. So my two cents there is by taking dairy off your plate, you can significantly reduce your risk of heart disease and diabetes, and even cut the chances of uh, being diagnosed with certain cancers by more than uh, 70%. Yes, by more than 70% if you cut down the dairy and remove dairy from your plate. 
and uh, as you all know that some people think that what about low fat milk and it should be fine but both low fat milk and whole milk have been linked with uh, prostate cancer and there have been various meta analysis have been done and published in peer reviewed journals and they've linked to uh, uh, prostate cancer so uh, with all these mechanisms we know that it's a complete cocktail of promoting these lifestyle disorders and the more we uh, shift away from dairy the better, better it is for us uh, as you all know that uh, what others people have mentioned about oat milk is so sustainable and tasty and you can it's so neutral that you can use it in your tea and i know people in india we love uh, our teas so those are some really great uh, alternatives available to save you from all the harmful effects of dairy that's amazing thank you so much for mentioning so many harmful effects of dairy on the human health but what about the planet's health we also have to worry about that there there's a report that was published by the institute for agriculture and trade policy in the us that shows that the emissions from 13 largest dairy companies including nestle and danon have the same combined greenhouse gas emissions of the as the entire uk as a whole of uk the fifth largest economy so it's that big so this question is for you dr silesh rao uh, is dairy the main reason you already mentioned that but can you please elaborate more on why dairy is causing the climate change and air pollution yeah dairy is uh, the uh, the main reason for raising cows and following which you get the leather industry the beef industry all you know a part of that and so because of this uh cattle grazing has used so much land on the planet and it's the uh, it's the source of so much methane emissions that and again methane emissions are in the ipcc they are still counting it over a 100 year time period which assumes that climate change is such a slow process that we only have to worry about it in the year 2100 in reality climate change is happening so fast that we need to be looking at 10 year 20 year time frames and when we look at 10 to 20 year time frames methane is the leading cause of climate change you know it is the number one gas not co2 methane is causing more heating on a 10 to 20 year basis than co2 so when we know that we realize that you know um dairy and uh, 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 cattle grazing is the leading cause of climate change no question about it okay you can look at it from a land use perspective you can look at it from a methane perspective you can look at it, but you have to look at it from a short term perspective because it is a short term problem we need to address it right now we don't have time to wait and the best way to address it is to get off our animal agriculture as quickly as possible all of it Yeah thank you so much that that is so true dairy dairy industry is probably the number one cause for air pollution um but yeah we all, we all know that it's not good for the health it's not good for the animals it's not good for the planet but still we are so obsessed we are so addicted this question is for you dr zishan ali once again why are we so addicted to dairy and what do we do what's the best way to break this addiction <laughs> that's a very good question and uh, uh we have we, we have done so many studies at pcrm and uh whenever we ask about giving up dairy and meat and the, the biggest problem comes from cheese and dr neil bernard has mentioned this in the book cheese trap and the reason uh, and cheese is the reason like the way why we crave for cheese is because of its casein and the casein when it's broken down into uh, its uh, components is uh, the 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 broken down fragments are called casomorphines it's a morphine like compound which is like i would say 10 times less potent as compared to morphine which is uh, as a which is made by the pharmaceutical companies but still it has the effect when you uh, when it it does the its magic that when you take this you would like to take more and uh, these are uh, like definitely these are these these opiates and these they work 
in the brain rewarding system that when they go to these receptors and they bind and they exactly bind the way like somebody's taking drugs or heroin or any other narcotics so what happens that when these opiates in these casomorphines when uh uh, casein gets broken down into multiple uh, casomorphines and I think it's various uh, lengths of amino acids and but few of them are really like opiate molecules and they bind to the opiate receptors and it's like a feel good feel good thing like you feel really really good and just imagine that uh, because milk has these casomorphines even the breast milk and even the cow's milk has those and look at the baby like uh, when the uh, you see the nursing baby, the baby is so calm and so happy when uh, she's uh, being or she, he or she is being uh, breastfed. So as I told you that dopamine when, when gets synthesized, it's like feel good hormone. And then you feel good about um, these uh, addiction. So that's why this is very, very difficult because you always want to go back, whatever has been, uh, has been produced, uh, uh, got produced or I would say whatever has produced this dopamine so you always want to go back to those kind of foods so uh, there was a study which I was reading when I was doing my uh, presentation is about the University of Michigan researchers they, they found out because even chocolate some people are addicted to chocolate so they found out that what happens that why people are so addicted so it's not the the brown color or the sugar in the chocolate it's it's the it's a it's the opiate right so what they did is they did, they did a neat study that uh, there was 26 volunteers and they gave them a drug called uh, naloxone i don't know how many people know about this drug it's an opiate blocker and it's normally used in uh, emergency rooms to stop these kind of uh, effects of drugs but what it what it turned out that when they gave, gave these uh, volunteers this kind of naloxone and when they gave they offered them to have a chocolate they they were not excited to have the chocolate because that opiate receptor had been blocked and there was no liking for the chocolate so it was pretty cool so the way we see that it is the addiction is coming from those kind of receptors and if we are able to block that we, we are uh, we can work on uh, on those but we cannot give those kind of blockers to people uh, worldwide so we have to find a way to stop that addiction mm -hmm. And what, what we can do is that I would say, uh, if you really want to, let's say you are somebody is addicted to cheese or chocolate, I would say start your day with a very good, heavy breakfast, maybe steel cut oats or with the uh, fruits and everything so that you don't feel hungry because when you don't feel hungry, you will not have cravings. It's pretty simple, straightforward process that have a, a good uh, breakfast. And then also uh, in your lunch and your snacks and your and your dinner, make sure to include those uh, fiber heavy uh, beans and green vegetables and uh, like food from the power plate, you know, grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables. So if you are eating those foods and those are slow re releasing sugar and the fiber in them will keep you full, will uh, avoid all the uh, uh, the cravings for these unhealthy foods. And then also another thing, very important thing is that you all know about the hormone leptin. Yeah. So leptin shuts down whenever you go on a starvation diet. That means somebody who is uh, hungry, there is no satiety hormone. Leptin is also called satiety hormone. That means when you feel full, leptin signals that come on, it's time to stop, no more eating. So when we eat enough food, then uh, you are your leptin is, is is working. So make sure that you are eating enough food and don't shut off your leptin because the moment it shuts off, then you will have hunger and then you will have no control on your appetite. So the idea is that you keep control of your appetite. And then again, uh, I cannot emphasize more on exercise, resting enough, and social support. This is very important because addiction also always comes also from being isolated or being stressed or being bullied you know all these people they find themselves come in these comfort foods and then once it starts it's really becomes difficult to break those habits 
And so I've seen that some people, because of the research studies we do at PCR, that some people say that also there are times during the day when they have their cravings. So some people have cravings in the evening or even in, in the nighttime. So how can you avoid that? Let's say somebody has cravings at 10 o'clock. So I would suggest that try to go to your bed at 9 o'clock so that you can avoid those uh, those uh, cravings time. And uh, uh, these uh, the, the low-fat uh, plant-based diet will definitely keep you away from uh, uh, food seductions. Try to keep try to do a uh, make a resolution that I would like to stick to this low fat plant based diet for 21 days so that I can take off all my addictions and that really works that's a very good time to break those habits 21 days wow thank you so much that that's so good so much of information and and definitely um we'll study a lot about these and uh, and I'm sure our viewers also got um a lot of answers as to how they can avoid the addictions um and yeah i'll also start taking questions because uh, we have just a couple more questions i'll quickly finish it and uh, and speaking about addictions we are also addicted to meat and dairy apart from meat and their dairy and and that that's how the pandemics happened so this question is for genesis Genesis, what are your thoughts on the link between pandemics and the animal agriculture? Yeah, I think um, animal agriculture is super harmful. It has, um, it's not doing any good on our planet on um, this current pandemic that we're in right now. Um, if we weren't eating these animal products, we wouldn't really be in this situation right now. Um, so it's important not to eat it because it's not helping our planet, it's not helping our health, it's not helping the animals. So it's like we're at a battle with ourselves and we're just making things worse for ourselves. And um, I have younger siblings, so I want them to have a thriving planet to live on. And I want myself to have a thriving planet to live on and for future generations because we're not the only people that are going to be on this planet. So um, once new generations come, I hope that they won't have to fight for the planet like this. Um, and I hope that more pandemics won't like will stop happening because um this new one right now it's like never ending like it's like one thing after another so hopefully this will stop and hopefully we're all um we all stop eating animal products that these things won't happen anymore wow thank you so and, much and, uh, if i can add if you have just a minute i mean if you have if mm -hmm. i can add something sure. that uh, uh Sorry to say this, but I think uh, the coronavirus pandemic has given us uh, some, I would say, some insight. Actually, sometimes, you know, it's a blessing in disguise that it has exposed the vulnerability of uh, industrial meat. And the way we have seen the number of outbreaks in these meat processing plants. And, you know, with uh, Dr. Bernard, uh, I have participated in several uh, demonstrations across the U.S. across these meat processing plants because that's where the outbreak has started. So we, if this, because of this coronavirus, now we know that this industrial meat is a very big problem. And if mm -hmm. you don't stop it now, this will definitely come back because this interspecies uh, uh, farming and crossbreeding, and this is happening because of this, and we now... We are learning because of this coronavirus pandemic. Sorry to uh, add to the uh, okay. uh, words from Genesis. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, these are very insightful. Definitely, um, all of yours are actually thanking us, thanking uh, the panelists for such wonderful suggestions and recommendations. And Noah says he his dad quit dairy and bought your book. Thanks to Dr. Silesh Rao. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and then we, we're moving on to another question. Again, speaking about COVID-19 and the seasonal allergies and the cold and the coughs and all those that are affecting our immune system. Uh, Dr. Pamela, this question is for you. What are your thoughts on this? How do we strengthen our immune system? Absolutely. Well, it's a, another wonderful thing about a plant-based diet that it's so rich in vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytonutrients, 
So really we're looking first here at fruits and veggies. And uh, you know, I'm so happy to be on this panel that's so global all over the world. Uh, I don't know where you are listening from today, but I will say that here in Canada and in the US, we are recommending that people get half their plate from fruits and veggies. Unfortunately, many people here in North America are not yet reaching that goal. Maybe you, where you're listening, you are reaching that goal. I would encourage you to strive toward that. That's the first step really to building a, a stronger immune system is getting all of those fruits and veggies and then eating in a generally anti-inflammatory way. In this case, again, we're talking about plants, reaching for plant-based proteins, nuts and seeds, eating a high fiber diet, um, is all of these things are going to help to reduce inflammation in your body um, through your natural process of uh, detoxifying your body, the way your organs work every day, eating a high fiber diet, rich in, rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, uh, pulses, uh, beans and lentils. Uh, these are the foods we need to reach for to reduce our um, inflammation and also build our resistance to infection. We can also look to some kind of superfoods in this area like turmeric, ginger, garlic, adding more of those foods to your diet, perhaps eating more curries, um, having smoothies, juices. These things are really going to help you keep a strong immune system. But we can't forget, of course, about the public health recommendations like getting enough sleep, washing your hands. These things are also, of course, very important. But diet is part of a strong immune system and staying healthy. Wow, that's amazing. Amazing insights. Thank you so much. And we are all so motivated. Um, apart from we got all the answers, right? We got what do we do for calcium? How do we strengthen our immune system? And so many things, but people are still worried about proteins, especially people who are getting into sports and fitness and athletics. This question is for you, Dotsi Bosch. Dotsi, uh, can you please share your experience switching to plant-based diets and and how how did you how did you get there and and I still remember you saying that you felt like a machine right in that movie <laughs> how did you do that yeah gosh the protein thing right it's 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 gonna it's the bane of our vegan existence uh, I mean it you know protein is a macronutrient it's important it's uh, you know we need it for muscle repair and muscle muscle synthesis synthesis, little synthesis but it's not more important than so many of the other nutrients, macro and micro, that we need. Um, and so it's, it's, it's wild that protein is such an obsession, but in my opinion, it's probably, you know, it's been brought to us uh, by the marketing of meat and dairy. And dairy spent $91 million alone in the United States last year uh, peddling their product and trying to get us to ask the question, where are you getting your protein? So. Uh, you, I think it's really important when we get asked that question to to maybe ask back uh, that person how much protein they think they need because no one, I've never had anyone give an answer, much less a correct answer. People just don't have any idea. They just think that they need lots and lots of it. So uh, protein is in literally everything. I mean, lemons have protein, not a lot, but they have some. So it's, if you are eating a, uh, you know, a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet, you don't need to worry about it. And maybe you need to think about your protein a little bit if you're an Olympic athlete. But nowadays, I, I, I don't think about protein one minute of, of, uh, of any day at all of where it's going to come from. It's in the food. So um, at the highest elite level, I had to take in about 1.2, 1.3 grams per kilo of body weight, which really for me was like, 85, 90 grams a day, you know, and some people are, are, are getting in way too much protein, which the doctors can certainly tell us is, uh, you know, uh, an impetus to uh, a lot of our diseases, especially, you know, our, our top three diseases here, uh, top three killers in the United States. So I had a, a, a really extraordinary transformation from a meat and dairy based diet to plant based diet. I did it. Uh, I did it for ethics. I just started learning and, you know, we all know once you get on the rabbit hole, it's 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 difficult to come back out. And I didn't want to come back out. So I just said, okay, this is my new way of eating and I'm just going to figure it out. And really, honestly, I 
I just hope that I would stay the same because at this point I'm just a couple year, uh, yeah, a couple years out from Olympics, about two. And I thought if I can just please stay the same, <laughs> you know, because I think I can make the team if I stay as strong and 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 you know as fast as I am now. But man, oh man, I, I was floored. I got so much better. Uh, my inflammation decreased, my blood flow increased, uh, my my breathing got better. But what was really shocking was uh, to, to see my strength just, it, it almost doubled, literally. And you guys probably remember that scene in the Game Changers on the leg sled, um, where I went from pushing about 300 pounds to just under 600 pounds uh, times 60 reps times five sets, all on plants. <laughs> So, I mean, it's just, no one, no one can argue that one, uh, that, that you can't get strong and stay strong and build, uh, you know, lean, powerful muscle on plants. I know. I, I'm, I'm such a fan of you. Thank you so much for inspiring so many people all over the world and all these young athletes and, and sports persons, all those people who have so many doubts, so many questions about whether they can sustain with plant-based protein. You are such a role model and you have motivated, I think, millions of people. Thanks so much, Dotsi. Thank you. And, um, and then um, I was actually going through the, the document that you just shared, a scientific report on cow's milk health and athletic performance. It is amazing. I, I would love to read it all, but it's already very late in the night. But definitely, if people are interested, we will, we will share this so people know. Um, how they can up their athletic performance with uh, with this knowledge, with a scientific report. Thanks so much, Dotsi. Thank you very much. You you inspired all of us. And um, and then one last question from uh, the Daily Out Love and Panel is for Sandra. And Sandra, I'm sorry, I had to cut off from the first question. So this is this is the reason why because I I have been witnessing some disturbing footages. We are not going to be running away. We are not going to be looking away. So um, cows are skinned alive for obtaining softer leather. And um, and you bear witness and you know what, why this happens. Can you can you give us some brief insights, some, some experiences that you have? Uh, yes, I, I'll, I'll be brief and Yes, it's important, I think, not to look away from what we're doing uh, to animals. Um, I do have just one photo, but I would like to say that it's a very graphic photo. And so anyone who wants to close their eyes or look away now, um, please do because it, it, it is of a cow being uh, skinned alive. So uh, look away now if you want to, otherwise we'll briefly show this image uh, now. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. So uh, we have also a lot of other campaigns. Uh, this is really disturbing. Um, yeah, so we don't look away. Uh, we bear witness and we stand up for the planet, her her beings, her children. So we are all her children. So we are all people. And, and we are doing this uh, very cruel things to our own, our own kind, which is not right. So thanks so much for all that you do uh, to mm -hmm. save these animals and, and all of us, in fact, Thanks, uh, thanks to all those people who have turned vegan for the ethical reasons, and um, and also there's a question. Some uh, Dana was asking this question: What are some ways for passive vegans to become allies to animal liberation? Who wants to answer this question? Oh yes, Dina. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, uh, Dina. Uh, you, do you have someone in mind? Someone from the panelists? So my quick answer is don't be passive. Veganism is an infection, just like COVID-19 is an infection. But this is an infection we want to get lots of people to get. It. So we need to uh, minimize the social distancing. We need to go talk to people. We need to take off our masks and start talking about it. And uh, so... 
it's important for us to uh, spread the word because it's a matter of our survival as a species and for the survival of the planet. So it's uh, so you're doing a really good thing when you convince people to go vegan. Yeah, thank you so much. That also, definitely... it's good to remember that nothing, nothing ever great happened in the world from silence. Um, and I know it's scary. I know a lot of people that um, you know are vegan feel, oh, you know, I don't want to bother people. I don't want to like push my views on them. I don't want to be the weird one at the restaurant and everything. But maybe if you just try one. Uh, one step. So, you know, at the restaurant, um, be brave and, and, and ask the, the waiter for what plant foods they have. Uh, be, be kind when you do it, you know, but just, uh, I think with anything, just taking like one step and then you take a second and a third. And then before you know, it, you're not, you're not being silent at all. Yeah. Um, I, I just um, like to, can, can I just, Sorry, can I just add to that that um, I, I think also we need more activists. <laughs> um, it's one thing to become vegan and to change our diet, and that's a huge thing. But um, I think all over the world, just a tiny percentage of people are willing to put themselves on the line and be activists for the animals. We could do with a lot more. Yes, I, I agree. Um, Ani, Anita, the founder of Animal Save Movement says, Leo Tolstoy, uh, Tolstoy spoke to our moral duty to bear witness when you see a suffering creature come close, as close as you can. And uh, when you see a suffering creature come closer, as close as you can and try to help her. Thank you so much for that. And, and thanks so much for setting an example and running such a wonderful organization. Um, we have, we are, uh, we have, in, we are in 71 countries, thousand chapters. That's a lot of people. Thank you so much, Anita, for making this happen. Um, any more questions? Okay. I'll just add something uh, related to that last question. I think there are so many ways to move from being quiet in your veganism to opening up and being more bold and more confident. I think one step if you're nervous about how to speak to people is simply to share your own personal experience and the changes that have happened in your life and what motivated you to become vegan, I think that often will reach people. I think we can share on social media. Often people are motivated just first by the idea of trying delicious vegan food. We've commented so often today about how wonderful vegan food can be. So share your recipes, share your favorite things on Instagram or Facebook. I absolutely agree that we do need to become activists and there are so many ways to be activists. Uh, there's the street activism, attending vigils, that's so important. I think also writing to your elected representatives is also very important in terms of lobbying for policy and law change. So we don't need to stand silently as vegans. We can be part of the movement and part of helping animals and working towards animal liberation. Yes, that that's so true. Thank you so much for saying that. I, I completely agree with you. There's another question. Um, Sarah, uh, she's asking, what are the schools in India doing to educate about dairy? Uh, does anybody want to take that question? <laughs> I want to say I don't know what the schools are doing. However, I'm so glad to hear India being brought into this discussion today. We often talk about changes that are happening in dairy consumption. But we're often really talking about Canada and the US, maybe Europe data as well. We need to bring India into this conversation. We need to bring China into this conversation because when we talk about global change, that is where the uh, majority of the population of our global planet is living. Uh, 
And so absolutely continuing to uh, affect changes here in North America, but we need to be thinking about India and China when we're talking about our activism. I'm so glad to see PCRM uh, taking a step forward there. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for the work you are doing. I know so many activists and groups are active in India and China. And I do uh, hope to hear that um, education is happening related to dairy in uh, India in the education system. Uh, yes, uh, Pamela, that's definitely that's happening. And uh, the Physicians Committee is actually reaching out to uh, medical uh, colleges and universities. Uh, and we are uh, mostly it's education and advocacy about uh, telling them that uh, dairy, what they think is, uh, is 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 being like from ancestors, they have been drinking dairy. But now we are telling them it's not like it's just not like from ancestors. It's last only thousands of years. It has happened, and uh, we are uh, doing. Uh, we are reaching out to uh, individual chefs in most of the uh, urban cities of India. We are collaborating with non-profit organizations to create awareness about the harmful effects of dairy. Uh, most of the time, uh, the question always comes about ghee. And ghee is such an integral part of the Indian cultural system. People think that uh, it is uh, Ayurvedic and it has some good properties. But we tell them that uh, ghee is like any other fat. With Each gram has nine calories and saturated fat. So people are understanding, but uh, it's a long way to go. And we should keep doing this, what we are doing now. And things are changing because now we are getting such a tremendous response in uh, medical colleges that all the future doctors, when they are coming up now, they are getting ready to practice preventive medicine. And this is really great. And we are now collaborating with another organization in India. It's called Reverse Factor with Dr. Karan Kakkar and we will be doing few events together and only yesterday uh, we had a chat so we are doing more pcrm is definitely doing a lot of work my colleague Jia Zhu is doing a lot of work in china so definitely uh, but there is so much more because it's such a big country and so many different cultures intertwined with each other so there's a, a lot of work needs to be done Yes, that, that's, that's so true, uh, Dr. Zishan Ali. I must tell you that uh, being a part of Animal Safe Movement, we have around 100 social media handles and uh, our thousands of volunteers are working every day to educate people about the harmful effect of dairy. They, they're bearing witness. They are um, they're explaining about the harmful effects on the climate. So we have Climate Save, we have uh, Health Save. Uh, chapters all over India, and uh, and we are also educating uh, doctors in different uh, uh, medical schools, in hospitals. I'm working with uh, a restaurant chain that has one 120 um, outlets all over India called Hatti Kapi. So um, I've been able to convert 95% of their snacks into completely yeah. vegan. So so it is happening. There are there are a lot of uh, other vol volunteer organizations mm -hmm. that are working day and night to teach them about the harmful effects of dairy because dairy is is definitely caused a climate change of two degrees. It's two degrees higher in India already. I, I can already feel it. So it is happening. It's slow. It's baby steps, but but definitely um, thanks so much for inspiring and, and helping Indians. And I'm sure also China is a little, it's actually way ahead than India because they have more vegan restaurants in China than in India. So we have to get there in India. And there was another question. Um, uh, Nishma was asking if, um, how do how do people in India, especially the poor people, how how can they afford plant milks? Does anybody want to take this question? Uh, I would say that uh, like dairy milk, uh, how much does it cost? Like six sixty to hundred rupees per yes. kg, depending on where you live. And let's say soybean, uh, one kilo of soybean would cost how much? Maybe thirty rupees a kg. Mm -hmm. So if you make yeah. your own soy milk, then actually it's cheaper as compared to dairy milk. 
and just imagine that uh, i know these are we are talking about poor people who cannot afford we cannot explain them the nutrition because all they see is uh, they are you know they don't have money and we are it's affordability so i would say if it's uh, if you just make your own milk then soy milk would be definitely cheaper than dairy milk and in india we grow soy beans a lot so that's uh, not something we ex uh, we export from other countries yes so another answer my granddaughter gave is that we are uh, as we grow older we really don't need milk and that's true for yeah. us as a species as well you know we are the only species that drinks milk as an adult that too from another species yeah uh, it's time for us to grow up as a species and assume our responsibilities as the uh, climate regulator species of the planet and not still pretend to be infants we are not infants anymore that's true actually we don't need because the with with age we lose the the enzyme lactase to break down the lactose and this is the reason why we mention that 70 to 80% of lactose intolerance is there and especially in people of african american and asian origin so that means we don't need milk right very true and pamela pamela has mentioned so many great sources of calcium that those who think that milk is the only source of calcium where beans and greens is our logo and motto think about beans and greens when you think about calcium i know especially when you have great athletes like dotsy bot she she's she has shown us the way we we don't need to drink milk we we don't need <laughs> we don't need any milks actually <laughs> all right um any more questions kathleen says agriculture fairness alliance is trying to hire lobbies uh does anybody want to answer that i think that would be the last question i guess because we have yeah we almost did one hour 10 minutes now 11 minutes so another one one last question and we wind up this great session yeah i support the and uh, the agriculture fairness alliance with the monthly donation uh, because i think the work they're doing is very important uh, we need to get the voice of uh, our community in the halls of politics so that they start listening to us more than they listen to the dairy industry yeah i agree thank you so much for such a wonderful panel discussion dairy out and love in i hope we keep doing this throughout the year it's not just in feb february we we have to do this all our lives as long as uh, as far as we can get and as far as we can save as many animals as possible especially the the kindest and the sweetest and like the the cows are the most gentle animals creatures i have ever seen and and i think this great panel has uh, enlightened so many people so many thank you messages a lot of people are uh, thanking all of you from all over the world thanks so much for a very great session and i hope we could do more of this and um, with this i say a good evening good morning good afternoon and good night for me <laughs> for me too good night yeah i'm yeah. in india yes 